we give our time and attention and a very warm welcome to Elder Nushin Framke. Hello everyone, thank you so much for inviting me to talk to you about my trip. Um, see if I can be close enough to this. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, in February of this year, I was part of a witness trip we called Solidarity with the Suffering. There were 30 Presbyterians from around the country and also four ecumenical partners. We went to stand witness to what we could see and come home and tell about it. The trip got a lot of buzz in Presbyterian circles and we had incredible social media exposure. I'm very grateful for your invitation today and to come and tell you about what we saw in the big picture there. I want to start now by acknowledging that we are on the land of the Lenape people, specifically the Muncie tribe. This land acknowledgement is a first step towards reconciliation and peacemaking. We honor the generations of stewards before us and we pay our respects to the indigenous peoples who loved this land before us. Now, as the granddaughter of a survivor of genocide, and I'll tell you more about that, <laughs> I need to say that we are meeting here today in the midst of an ongoing genocide, one that must be stopped, and so we need to name it and call it out. Um, and we need to do all we can to help save lives now, in our own time, here and now. The good news is, this, in, in this deeply dire and tragic moment we find ourselves in, we have seen people of faith like yourselves co uh, coming together to reject the killing of innocent peoples in the thousands. So I am Armenian and originally from Iran. My Armenian family ended up in Iran because my grandmother walked into Iran as a 10-year-old refugee in 1915 as a survivor of the Armenian genocide. She is the reason why I do human rights advocacy and why I went on this trip in February. Because I carry generational pain, I have visceral feelings about what is going on right now in Israel-Palestine which since October 7th has awakened deep traumas for Jews and heightened 24-7 fears for Palestinians. But as writer Peter Beinart said recently in a New York Times column, the truth remains that denial of Palestinian freedom sits at the heart of this conflict, which began long before the creation of Hamas in the late 80s. I'd like to share with you today some of what my, my uh, solidarity group saw on our trip, and then do an overview of Gaza through some graphics and visuals. And then we'll look through a wide angle lens, putting Palestine in a global context, asking how and why did we get here? I hope to interest you in finding out more after today. Honestly, each of these sections could take its own hour. So I will race through my slides so that we can have a little time for questions. The trip I went on was organized by Sabil, the Liberation Theology Center in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Sabil is a Palestinian Christian organization, and this image is the cover of their trip guidelines. They call them come and see trips. Sabil means the way in Arabic, and it's after Jesus who said, I am the way. The phrase, come and see, is spoken by Jesus in the Gospel of John and has been used to describe these witness trips. I want to start out by showing you the East Jerusalem hills that I spoke about during worship. An Israeli settlement in a Palestinian area starts with what they call an outpost. Settlers will secretly buy a property or just move in by force and raise the Israeli flag. Then the Israeli military shows up to protect the settlers. 
This is one we saw in the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem, near the headquarters of the UN's UNRWA compound. UNRWA is the UN agency tasked to take care of Palestinian refugees since 1949, when 750,000 refugees were created by the founding of Israel. We met with the director there, who is at the center of the picture. You can see him wearing a white name tag. They're also noticed that their UN flag has been at half mast since October 7th. We drove from hilltop to hilltop in East Jerusalem, which is in the West Bank, beyond the border of the 1967 border of Israel. So it's not in Israel proper, in Israel itself, according to international law. Unless you call the whole thing one state, this is beyond Israel. Um, it is considered occupied territory since 1967, but Israel has basically annexed it and is building settlements at breakneck pace. This is what one settlement looked like in 2017. These modular buildings show up overnight, and Israel calls them outposts. And today, this outpost is one of the biggest settlements in East Jerusalem. Here on the right is what it's become today since 2017. This is my picture of Nof Zion settlement taken from across the valley. It will be expanded down that dirt hill you can see. The picture on the left is the jam-packed Palestinian neighborhood I took the picture from. Here's another settlement with the modular outpost still there. Another example of many. And just as a reminder, here are maps showing Israel proper in gray on the left and the West Bank in yellow. So we're only talking about the West Bank, not Israel itself. This is the Silwan neighborhood across the valley from Nof Zion settlement. I want to share their art project with you called the Eyes of Silwan. Look for eyes painted on these houses. Palestinians are powerless against the land grab of the huge Jewish-only settlements. So they are watching them across the valley in Silwan with these murals. I counted about a dozen sets of eyes on this one hill. There's a close-up. I see you. I see what you are doing. Also, at the bottom of the picture, you can see black water tanks on rooftops. They have these water tanks because the municipality doesn't give them water, doesn't get everyone water. So Palestinians collect rainwater, which is scarce, and buy expensive water that's delivered. And here's a garbage dumpster we saw in the Silwan neighborhood because the municipality doesn't pick up garbage very often or with any regularity. Like I said in my article when I was reading in worship, Palestinians end up having to burn their garbage for this reason, and a few blocks away is a different planet. Here's a Jewish neighborhood in East Jerusalem with clean, wiped, wived, paved roads, and um, it's not that the Palestinians don't like clean roads. They just don't get any municipal services. The difference was jarring, and the apartheid was in full view. Apartheid is an Afrikaans word meaning separation. Of course, it's also a legal term for two systems of law based on ethnicity, race, or religion. We went to this place in the Silwan neighborhood where literally the day before, Israel had demolished the house of this community leader. His name is Fakhriya Abu Diab. As you can see, he served us tea in the rubble. It's one of our teacups. It's become a common story. Three to four generations have to squeeze into a house that they aren't allowed to expand. They apply for permits to build additions and they are denied. In the end, some people add on anyway and eventually the Israeli authorities come and demolish the house for building without a permit. And they send them the bill for the demolition. This house held four generations. 
Here's some of our group, five ministers and one elder, holding pieces of the demolished house. We all brought a piece home with us as an Ebenezer for our advocacy work. We met with church leaders, on the, and on the left you see me with Reverend Dr. Jerry Pillet, who is the General Secretary of the World Council of Churches, which is the biggest church umbrella group there is. He's a South African Presbyterian, and happened to be there on a solidarity trip at the same time we were. And he came with a small European delegation. But there was no tourists, no solidarity groups. We were the first in like four months, I think it was, or three months anyway. And we met with a Lutheran bishop in the center there. We met with a Latin patriarch, the head of the Catholic Church there. They are, they are, they are Palestinian Christians. And we met with the Armenian archbishop. And just to give you the sad decline of Christians in the land of Jesus, um, Palestinian Christian numbers have dropped from 10% of the entire population in 1922 to under 1% today. I mean, they are an endangered species. In Bethlehem, which used to be a very Christian community, um, understandably because it's Bethlehem, uh, they have dropped from 84% in 1922 to about 20% today. They, the Christians, are the first to leave because Western countries give them immigration papers much more easily than their Muslim siblings. But there's a stalwart Christian community still there. We were in Bethlehem for the first Sunday in Lent this year, and we worship with Palestinian Christians. We split up into three groups and attended Catholic, Melkite, and Lutheran services. I attended a Catholic mass held in St. Catherine's Church, which is a Franciscan church, literally attached to the Church of the Nativity, the church that was built in the fourth century. That's, we're looking at St. Catherine's Church here. It was a cold and rainy day, but the big church was packed. On the left, you can see their bulletin, and since I read Arabic, I told the friends with me that the scripture was on Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness. So let me show you now two very short clips from that day so you can see our Palestinian Christian siblings in worship, which is in Arabic. Just two short clips. with many different civil society groups. Seen here clockwise from the left are Dr. Mazen Gamsia and his wife, and he is a scientist who left his tenured position at Yale to return home and establish a biodiversity center in Bethlehem. He is helping bring back indigenous flora that are key to the region. We met with the head of al Ghut's Human Rights Center, that's him in the middle. And we visited Ida refugee camp, this young woman in blue, 
is running a theater group, a theater, theater program for teenagers in the refugee camp. And we met with spokespeople from the group representing political prisoners, many of whom are held without charge in a Kafkaesque military system. And this last one on the lower left is a group of church leaders from across the churches in Bethlehem who came and had dinner with us that evening, that Sunday. This is a terrible selfie at the wall outside Ida refugee camp in Bethlehem. The graffiti they put up in 2014 asking Presbyterians to divest from human rights violations has survived and is still up on that wall there. You can see it says, Presbyterians, please divest. <coughs> this is from 10 years ago. Just outside Bethlehem, we met with Daoud Nassar, truly a Palestinian Christian icon for nonviolent resistance. His family owns a farm they call the Tent of Nations, and it is on the last hilltop not taken by Israeli settlers. They have, they have land deeds going back to the 19th century, but Israel will not allow the Nassars to build on their land. So we met with them in this cave that's dug into the land. Israel will not connect them to electricity or water. So they collect rain in cisterns and they have solar panels for their energy needs. This is Dar al Kalima University, located in Bethlehem established in 2006. It is a Palestinian university specializing in arts, culture, and design. They have been graduating creative young leaders, and the PCUSA, the Presbyterian Church USA, was an early key funder of this school. We can talk to you about that grant later if you want. We met with Palestinian Christian educators in Bethlehem Bible College. These are their old and new buildings. One is behind the other. And inside the new building of the college, we all bought something from their gift shop, um, including some of these Christmas ornaments made from American tear gas canisters used against them in the streets of Bethlehem. <clears throat> and finally, this story from my trip. On our second day in Bethlehem, heading out of the Tent of Nations, the farm, on a very foggy morning, we came across an actual land seizing, a land seizing event. We stopped our minibuses and decided to take a direct action witness um, against this land grab. Again, this was Palestinian land in the West Bank, southwest of Bethlehem, not inside the borders of Israel. The Israeli military were there protecting the land grab, not the Palestinian farmer who was losing his land. I wrote an article about this day in, um, in Mondo Weiss, and there are links to lots of videos there that many of us live streamed on social media, but I, I can share a very short clip here with you. So I don't have time to go into the whole story, uh, but it's an incredible day and uh, time that we spent doing this. I mean, it was a, if you weren't radical going there, you would have been radical after this time against the Israeli military. It's, it's really a galvanizing thing to go through. So that was a race through our week in the West Bank. There was so much more, but you saw some of the lowlights. And while we didn't get to go to Gaza, because we couldn't, I can't not address it here, given what is unfolding there. So now let's take a quick look at some information on Gaza. We can't possibly cover um, the whole thing fairly in a short time that we have, but I'll try to give you some key info. And this graphic shows where most of the 2.3 million people in Gaza came from originally in the map. You can see the, the, the green square shows where Gaza is, and the yellow dots are the 190 villages 
where people were ethnically cleansed from that are now inside Israel. They're, and they pushed them into eight refugee camps. Here are those refugee camps and the names of the villages um, that they came from. And now every refugee camp now has been bombed by Israel. So Gaza is 25 miles long and about six miles wide with a population of 2.37 million as of 2022. So it's about twice the size of Manhattan with more than double the population. So the clock doesn't start on October 7th for Gaza. The military siege of Gaza began in 2006. It was locked down and described by many as the world's largest open air prison. And for over 16 years, the people of Gaza have been living under an Israeli imposed blockade that severely limits travel, trade, and everyday life for the over two million residents. And this book cover you can see is by a renowned Israeli historian. So the, the prison term is used by an Israeli historian. As a result of that siege, the effects have been brutal, even prior to the expanded siege, and now the, uh, with this bombardment underway now. This picture shows the neighborhood around the destroyed Al Farouk Mosque. Imagine that around a church somewhere in the world. So in March, the death toll surpassed 30,000. The majority of 2.2 million are displaced. They're facing catastrophic levels of hunger and famine. The healthcare system has been crippled. The hospitals are battlegrounds now. And approximately 96% of the water there is undrinkable. Electricity only available sporadically. And most of the population has been pushed south into tent cities. And on the left is a basic map showing Gaza. On the right, we see how many trucks of supplies were allowed in a day. Over the 16-year siege, about 500 trucks a day got through the blockade to supply food uh, and you know, medicines and supplies. Of course, the 500 a day during the siege years were never enough. October 7th stopped the trucks, and by the end of the month of October, only about 11 were getting in. This is for over 2.2 million people. In mid-March, Israel was forced to allow more in. And now it's a trickle of about, on a good day, 200 trucks. Um, so um, imagine 200 trucks supplying that number of people. The striped areas on the map on the left show locations of Israeli ground operations. The pink area shows evacuation zones. The map on the right shows damaged areas from Israeli bombings. Keep in mind, we the US provide ammunition and funding for the bombings. On the left, we see that by March 20th, 1.7 million had been forced to leave their homes. And on the right is a picture showing the same beach in August 2022 and the same beach in November 2023, which is now an Israeli military stronghold. And those are tanks and soldiers you see on the beach. So I'm hoping you're coming across some of these pictures from Gaza in your daily news intake. It's not about getting rid of Hamas. If anything, this is creating more Hamas. We'll get to the why this is happening in part three. This is a tweet by Philippe Lazzarini, the commission, commissioner general of the UN's UNRWA agency. That's the group that handles the refugees. He posted this graphic in March. It reads, Staggering, the number of children reported killed in just over four months in Gaza is higher than the number of children killed in four years of wars around the world combined. That's the, he also posted the graphic. The war is a war on children. 
It is a war on their childhood and their future. And this graphic is from January, so the numbers are dated. But it says it would take 177 buses to carry the Palestinian children killed. Gaza has been described as a graveyard for children by UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez. Mass killings are the tip of the iceberg of Israeli violations against Gaza's children. UNICEF reported that around 1,000 children in Gaza have lost one or both legs. This is back in January. And thousands have lost one or both parents. So this is a banner that was posted on buildings all over Israel. The Biden administration and Chuck Schumer have tried to blame Benjamin Netanyahu and talked about his removal as if that will solve the problem. It's much bigger than Benjamin Netanyahu. The culture at large is all in on destroying Gaza. And the, this banner says victory is zero people left in Gaza. And um, here is a quote from the Minister of Defense. There will be no electricity, no food, no fuel. We are fighting human animals and we are ac acting accordingly. And a quote from the Minister of National Security. The only thing that needs to enter Gaza are hundreds of tons of explosives from the Air Force, not an ounce of humanitarian aid. So um, attacking UN workers also is a war, war crime, and Israel has killed a record number of UN workers. Nine times more UN workers were killed in Gaza in 2023 than were killed in all other countries combined. Nine times. And lastly, for the Gaza section, I have an audio clip for you from an interview with Dr. Michael Fakhri, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. UN Rapporteurs are independent experts appointed by the UN Human Rights Council with the mandate to monitor, advise, and publicly report on human rights situations around the world. Um, there are 45 thematic areas that these um, rapporteurs work in, and they are not paid, so they're independent, and they're, but they are supported by the UN infrastructure. Uh, so here is Dr. Fakhri, international law specialist on the right to food. And this is talking to starvation experts all over the world. In Gaza, we've never seen a civilian population in modern history made to go hungry so quickly and so completely. That's what's really unique there. So since, since 2011, there's been an increase in famine and starvation. Famine is never a natural occurrence. It's always the result of political choices. And since uh, Somalia, there's been an increased rate, more and more, which means that international institutions have been failing more and more in addressing the issue of food being used as, as a weapon. So when we get to this point in Gaza, where we've never seen two, so the number is 2.3 million people, over half of which are children, made to go hungry, and predictably, it was so preventable. So within weeks of the war, we, myself, amongst uh, other special partners who focus on water and housing and health, it's not, it's not by chance that those were the mandates that immediately raised the alarm on a risk of genocide. Because we could see so clearly what was happening. Because on October 8th, Israel announced its starvation campaign. On October 8th, Israel said it. We're going to starve them. Basically, what they literally said was, we're going to make sure that there's no food, no fuel, no water into Gaza. And then they did it, and they blocked all the water to northern Gaza, and there's been a clear campaign of starving everyone in northern Gaza as absolutely as possible to push everyone south while they starve everyone at a slower rate uh, in the rest of Gaza. And so it raises the question, how was Israel able to do this? That's the question I'm 
put, putting that towards everyone in the international spaces. How was this made possible? It didn't happen overnight that Israel announces on October 8th they're going to do it, and then they do it, and then it happens, and it's all been predictable. So I sort of ease them into it. So I start with the 17-year blockade against Gaza. Sure. But this is a longer campaign. This is in the context of apartheid. This is in the context of settler colonialism. And it's not just about Gaza. So by focusing on food, it allows us to see the broader context that the rate of settler violence in the West Bank in the last year and a half has been at record rates with attacks against farmers, denial of access to olive trees and the harvesting of, of olives. And the attack against Unamwa is not just an attack, of course, it's against refugees, but that's a denial of food, basically, or threatening food security of all Palestinian refugees in Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, and the West Bank, and occupied West Bank, and East Jerusalem, and, and, and Gaza. So by focusing on food, you immediately see this context of this is a full attack against the Palestinian people as a people, and Gaza is the epicenter of that attack of the horror, but let's, it gives you that, the, the geographical sense, and of course, the historical sense. It allows you to understand the 17-year blockade, the apartheid regime, and, and settler colonialism uh, from the get-go, right? It, okay, so that's a kind of a mind-blowing look at some of the facts on Gaza. Uh, so now let's turn to the, the why questions and why is this happening. You heard Dr. Fakhri say in that audio clip at the end, a couple of times he mentioned settler colonialism from the get-go, he said. So current scholarship maintains that Palestine is an example of indigenous people losing ancestral land to settler colonialism. So what exactly is settler colonialism? Settler colonialism is a form of colonialism that is exclusive. It's a winner-take-all, a zero-sum game, whereby outsiders come to a country and seek to take it away from the people who already live there. They remove them, replace them, and displace them. They take over the country, and they make it their own. This is a definition from Patrick Wolfe the Australian historian and scholar who is credited with establishing the field of settler colonial studies. While colonialism was after resources, settler colonialism was after the land itself and means to eliminate the people there. These colonists intend to stay and intend to remove or eliminate the people already there because the project is a zero-sum game. There can only be one winner. We know this model of colonialism because we live in one. Some others are Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and of course South Africa. Zionism in Palestine is a settler colonial pro project, and Israel remains to this day a settler colonial state. This depiction is now widely accepted in the scholarly world, but rejected by mainstream Israeli scholars, says Ilan Pape, an Israeli historian. And the field of post-colonial studies was born in the 1980s, after global decolonization began in the wake of World War II, when people started to gain independence from colonial powers. In the last 20 years, this field of study has grown exponentially, and Israel-Palestine is no longer spoken of as a conflict, but as a colonial project that came at the end of the colonial era. Of course, this is being contested. And this photo shows members of the Haganah paramilitary group, or terrorist group, uh, expelling, they, know, they were known as terrorist groups at the time, uh, before the creation of Israel. And this picture shows them expelling Palestinians out of Haifa after the Jewish forces took control in 1948. So um, Israel is a settler colonial state, but it's a unique type of settler colonialism. It is a colonization by a people with a historical connection to the land. 
That's never happened before. So it's new and different from past settler colonization. And we, we will hear more about this unique form in a short video I have with two American scholars. But as with it, with the new world, colonization of the new world, this colonization, which you're looking at another settlement in the West Bank, this colonization was also, um, is connected to us um, because it's also based on religious justification. That's the connection with what's known as the doctrine of discovery and with our own continent, which was first settled by religious settlers who used scripture as justification and said that they were sanctioned by God. This is a familiar story for Palestinians. The American story of a new Zion or a city on a hill, which I'm sure you've heard those terms, are wrapped up in the history of the doctrine of discovery which goes back to 1493, when the Pope gave the church's blessing to claim, uh, to claim any land not inhabited by Christians and to, quote, civilize them. And it's the origin of white supremacy, the doctrine of discovery is. And the Presbyterian Church USA repudiated the doctrine in 2018, um, finally. <laughs> And actually, the Vatican repudiated it only like two years ago, or maybe it was only a year ago, so yeah. Um, and uh, so this doctrine set off the race, European race, to colonize the rest of the world. Let's look at the global context. These maps show empires at different stages and times, built on the doctrine of discovery. I don't have maps of the Dutch, the German, the Belgian, or the Portuguese empires and colonies up. But as you can see, with the Spanish Empire, the British, the French empires, you can see that over the centuries, Europeans took over other people's lands all across the globe at one time or another. And this was done with the blessing of the church. Now, the end of colonization began to unfold in an era after World War II, after centuries of subjugation, self-determination was finally written into, the law, uh, into law in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And as you can see, independence from, co from colonialism finally came. The number of member countries in the UN exploded in the last 75 years. It started, you could see, in 1945 with 51 countries that co-founded the UN, and today it's 193 countries. Now, Tony Judd, renowned British Jewish historian who used to run the Remark uh, Institute at NYU, he famously called Israel an anachronism, a mistake in time. Um, in a 2003 article in the New York Review of Books, Judd said Israel came too late in history, in an era when colonial powers were ending colonization, um, Israel was settling um, on indigenous people's lands. So as for the American empire, as the American West was absorbed, and the frontier became new states, the mandate of manifest destiny of civilizing the savages shifted from territorial expansion going west to going beyond our own borders. And after World War II, the definition of empire changed. American empire became defined by military bases around the world rather than acquiring land. And after World War II, many bases were acquired by the US from Britain through the Lend-Lease program of, of the war. And by 2013, we had around 5,000 bases with a, around 750 overseas. Here's the familiar story and visuals of our own settler colonialism in the US, which today we acknowledge resulted in genocide. We are looking at the loss of land for the indigenous people of this country as seen from 1850 onward, left to right. 
It's a tragic and familiar story, and the red areas show the native nations and their disappearing lands taken by white settlers. And here is the map of disappearing Palestinian lands, beginning just before the creation of Israel in 1947, on the left, and moving to today. It is very much like the map of white settlement across the US, even though there are far-right extremists in the Israeli government today who say that Palestinians are an invented people. Palestinians are, in fact, the indigenous people of this land, with centuries, if not millennia, of connection to the land. And this is a BBC map that shows what's known as the matrix of control, with all the purple and lavender areas under Israeli control. Again, this is not Israel. This is the West Bank. If you look at the pattern, you can see a grid controlling the land through a network of settlements and roads. This was based on a plan that Ariel Sharon imported from South Africa in the 80s. He took a trip there to see how the South African uh, white apartheid regime controlled the vast non-white majority population there. Many settlers are extremists armed with serious weapons. Violence by extremist Israeli settlers is commonplace and rarely prosecuted. And there are over 700,000 of them. And they are in violation of international law. Um, many of them are actually from Brooklyn. And they are protected by the Israeli military when they attack Palestinians or poison grazing fields for the sheep and goats and so on. And you might have heard it said in the media that Israel lives in a tough neighborhood and that we must support them because of that tough neighborhood. When I hear that, I hear it as an echo of what we hear here about black and brown neighborhoods being tough neighborhoods. At best, this is a dog whistle, and at worst, it's a racist call for supporting segregation, separation, and apartheid. So now we're going to wrap up with this six-minute video. I do have a few slides after this six-minute video, only a few left. But I want to show this six-minute video of two important American scholars, one Jewish, one Palestinian, talking about Israel as a settler colonial state. because they're experiencing this constant rejection, although they're doing sort of everything that's been told to them, they're still not being welcomed in these societies as Jews, right? We can point to the Dreyfus Affair in France, we can point to other anti-Semitic scandals in this time period. One of those movements, of course, is the Zionist movement that, that comes out, and this is a minority movement, and what it argues is that there's no place for Jews in Europe, and that Jews need to, to move to a land of their own. And this is the moment at which uh, the movement for Jewish self-determination turns from being a movement of resistance to one of colonialism and settlement. Because, of course, there's no place in the world that's unoccupied, right? And there are all sorts of ideas bandied about, including Uganda, as it turns out, right? This is one of the, the, the ideas uh, that Herzl himself was putting forward. Place in the world where Jews should settle, but of course it was then Palestine or the land of Israel, which is the one that the movement rallied around. And from the very beginnings of that movement, there are efforts to displace the indigenous Palestinian community. And you can see it in the writings of Herzl, um, in his own diary writings, in, in speeches of Zionist leaders, and they're trying to push out Arabs because they bring with them. The, the, the racist and colonialist ideas that are present within European society 
and they, they, they bring that with them into their, their practice of settlement and colonization um, in the name of Zionism, in the name of Jewish self-determination. whatsoever in describing the Zionist movement from its inception and the Zionist project up to this day as a separate colonial movement. Um, it's different from every other separate colonial movement. It's somewhat similar to some. But it is by not only various yardsticks we can use, by its own self-description for its first 40 to 50 years, a separate colonial movement. All the settlements established in Palestine, all the colonies self-described, established in Palestine before 1948, are established by something called the Jewish Colonization Agency. That's not my associated JC. It's not my description. That's their description. You read Herzl, you read Ben Gurion, you read Jabotinsky, the founder of the strain of Zionism that develops into liquid. They talk about this with, that, with no, in private at least, they talk about this with no qualms. We are a colonial separate movement. There is an indigenous population we have to move. That's what we have to do. Like, uh, like others have done, we are going to, now remember, they are talking in the era of high colonialism. They are talking in an era where colonialism, colonization, separate colonialism are not in a bad order. Where they are fully accepted. Where Britain and France are separate colonial powers and Britain is protecting the Zionist movement. There's no shame in it. So in this, in this aspect, I have, I have no problems with this. Uh, and you can take it up to the present. I mean, look at what happens in the West Bank day in, day out. What is it that separate colonialism? Look at what happened to the, to the, to the, to the land taken over uh, by the state of Israel from 1948 until 1967. Look what happened to the Arab population. Look what happened to their rights. Look what happened to their property. Look what happened to the, to the Jewish population. Look at how the two peoples were treated. The two groups were treated. It's a settler colonialism. There's no other possible way of describing it. It is a unique form of settler colonialism I'm prepared to accept. That it has manifold differences from South Africa, from Algeria, from Canada, from Australia, I'm prepared to accept. That it also has other characteristics I am prepared to accept. For example, it is not an extension of the metropole, which every other settler colonial movement is. The Dutch settlers in South Africa were originally extensions of the Dutch of the Netherlands. British settlers in North America were extension of the crown, extensions of the crown. The French in, North, in Algeria were French persons, French people, extensions of the metropole. Zionism wasn't like that. It was completely different in multiple respects. I go into that. I don't need to go into that further. Now, where's the hard part? The hard part is the national aspect. The hard part is that settler, successful settler colonial projects eventually turn into a nation state. Ooh, we just heard a, a, a moving uh, 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 acceptance of the fact that we stand on somebody else's land here in Providence. Okay, so who would deny the settler colonial nature of this country? No one in their right mind. But who would deny that it is a nation state? that a national, a national entity has been created, or that the same has happened in Canada, or that the same has happened in Australia, or that the same has happened in New Zealand. Nobody in their right mind, even while accepting the settler colonial origins of every one of those four states. Okay, so wrapping this up, Zionism is the name of the political ideology of the state of Israel. So quick review on this one slide about what these two professors just covered about Zionism. Zionism was always settler colonialism, but in a unique form. The contradiction within Zionism is that it was both a national and a settler movement at the same time. And it was a movement for rights of an oppressed people, but it also took away rights from another people. And Zionism succeeded in creating a new and thriving national entity in Israel, just as the US did and Canada and the others. And the hard part is that to become a nation, it had to displace, they, all these groups, had to displace and erase people. So what comes next? Um, 
Israel-Palestine example of settler colonialism is unique and it is happening right now. An Israeli historian I mentioned before, Ilan Pape, says that the final stages of settler colonialism are the most painful for the indigenous. Think Trail of Tears. Today, there are about 15 million people living in this land that is from the river to the sea. Half are Jewish, half are not. Unless some are forced to leave, they will need to find a way to live together. And of course, leaving, pushing them out is ethnic cleansing. So this is why decolonization is the way forward. Unlike what it sounds like, decolonization is not a subtraction from society, it's an addition. It adds to society. For example, Jeff Halper, the founder of Israeli Committee Against House Demolition, talks about both peoples representing a shared new country on a national football team at the World Cup. That would be a nice decolonization um, development. Could look like the Swiss model of federated cantons with several languages, but one team, one country. So that's uh, one example of de what decolonization could look like. Um, and this is the challenge now. How to decolonize this land so that there is a shared future for all. So there is another trip coming together by the same people who uh, I went with. They, they're organizing this trip May 26th to June 6th. I had two weeks notice and I packed my bag and went with a carry-on. Um, you can use peacemaking monies from New York City Presbytery or from, if you have a peacemaking offering in the fall, if you take a peacemaking offering, this can cover or help cover some of the cost of the trip. So, um, and you can read all the blog posts from the trip that I went on at this website, vipmn.org, which is the mission network, the Presbyterian mission network that I've been doing this advocacy now for 20 years. Um, and this is Bruce Reyes Chow. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's a former moderator of the Presbyterian Church USA. He was elected to a two-year term in 2008, and he's been a national Presbyterian voice ever since. He was on our trip. And he's leading another trip in May, earlier than the one I just showed you, but his tri trip is already booked up. <laughs> and he's asked me to ask you all to follow him on Instagram. So that's his handle, at B. Reyes Chat. Because um, he'll be posting videos and messages every day when he's in Palestine. And lastly, I want to show, draw your attention to this um, study paper approved by our General Assembly in 2022 written by the GA committee that I serve on. This is the Committee on Ecumenical and Interfaith Relations. It's a PCUSA webpage, as you can see, and there's a free download of our paper denouncing anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. I hope you can incorporate it in some of your conversations and studies here. Um, and we have 20 years worth of, well, more actually, uh, we have probably 70 years worth of Presbyterian policies on this region, but I, um, this network that I'm part of was established 20 years ago, and so this network has been very active in moving our policies forward, and um, I think there's handouts of those policies on, at, on the table on your way out. There's also um, uh, an article I wrote comparing Israeli settler colonialism to American settler colonialism. So grab one of those on your way out. So yeah, thank you. Like 
have this history of that they are an oppressed people and that we should protect the oppressed. Also that this is their ancient homeland, right? And that they are not a displaced indigenous, that they right. are themselves a displaced yeah. Yeah. indigenous people. And yeah. if you could just, um, I, you know, I get to that part of the conversation and I don't know what to say. Well, I think the, the best answer is they need to share the land. Yes, they, you don't want to deny them that um, right to their ancient homeland. But that doesn't mean you deny the right to Palestinians. I mean, it's not actually, the it's not that complicated. There's that amount of land, 15 million people, half of them are Jews, half of them are not. Nobody's going anywhere. They've got to move forward sharing that land. So yeah, I mean, you're not denying that, that there's, it's a unique new form of settler colonialism, like I explained. Yeah, somebody else. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to know, I, I worked on the Kibbutz in Israel back in 1970. Yeah. And, um, you know, I did all kinds of great things like peeling potatoes and uh, inoculating chickens. And, I'm, and I met the, the people who settled the kibbutz, for the most part, were people who had escaped annihilation in the war. And, and the stories I heard were really incredible. So my question is, what has happened to that whole kibbutzim culture and organization? Well, you know, this was started with a very kind of socialist and some e even communist um, connections, and they were very socialistic when they first started. But that's all out, gone. I mean, there are, there are still kibbutzim that people live in, but the, the socialism, I mean, they're, they're a very far-right country now. 70% of the country supports what's going on in Gaza. This is not a, you know, socialism of, of the 50s and 60s. It's, yeah. I just want to ask you to comment on uh, another uh, basis for what's happening right now, and that is that uh, the demographic side, and I, I know that the, they didn't actually touch on it, but the uh, demographic projections prior to what's going on right now was that the Palestinian population was going to outgrow the uh, Israeli population, uh, I think, within a couple of decades. Uh, and that, uh, so part of the calculation behind what is happening right now with the killing of children and women and so forth was in fact designed to decrease the population of Palestinians uh, in such a way that that demographic uh, imbalance could be possibly corrected in favor of the uh, Israelis. Is there any, you know, have, have you heard anything to suggest that the calculation has been that explicit, or is that just a result of what's happening right now? I, mean, I have heard that. There are some places that put that out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't know if you remember, I don't know how many years ago it was now that Netanyahu was in France and he asked the French Jews that he was meeting with to come to Israel, um, you know, because they've been trying to get Jews from around the world to make aliyah, which is the word used to make, um, to go to a higher place it means in Hebrew, to, to go to Israel and become Israelis, right? To, to bolster the Jewish population. But at the time, I mean, basically, what, what's happening, so, so when, when Netanyahu asked the French Jews to do that, and, and he, he said, you're, you're one of us, kind of come be with us, I don't know if you saw this scene where the French group broke out and sang the French national anthem, sang the Marseillaise. <laughs> they said, no, no, we're French. <laughs> you know, um, but what's interesting is what's happened is because of what's happened in Gaza, you know, it, it, the, the, the raison d'etre, the whole reason that Israel exists was to be a safe home for the Jews of the world, right? But because of what's happening now, that reason has gone up in smoke. It's not a safe place for Jews anymore. You know, so Jews are better off staying where they are, <laughs> not going to Israel. So, 
Yeah, those numbers, I mean, they, they, like I said, they're about half and half right now, which is surprising because most people think there are more Arabs. But no, they're about half and half. So I don't know if that <laughs> answers your question or not. But Yeah. One of the things that, that uh, first of all, thank you for sharing all of your trip with us and all of your knowledge and expertise. And one thing that we have thought is like how they have, from the Israeli side, they have normalized the word like terrorist. So everything that comes out of the, uh, from Gaza or from the West Bank is like, oh no, they are terrorists. And they have to make everybody else uh, share this. And if you don't share that, then they attack you. And when you understand, like, uh, I was talking to you about Tantura. Uh, those of you who have not watched it, please watch it. But it's like once you understand the whole context, then it's like it's very easy to to fall into these these things. Where, for instance, when they were uh, calling Nelson Mandela a terrorist, yeah. and then you ask him, "Hey, what do you think about Nelson Mandela?" "Oh no, nice guy, yeah, a terrorist." Mm -hmm. So then, what's once you normalize the word terrorist for the Palestinian people, then they start justifying everything that they're doing. Oh, because we're defending against the terrorists. Yes, it's that tough neighborhood. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Do you foresee that there would be hundreds of thousands of people dying because of the starvation tactic they're using right now, instead of 30,000 people dead? Wait, was there a question? Yeah, I said, do you think, are we going to see in a couple of months hundreds of thousands of people dying because of the starvation tactic? I mean, some people say, like, in a kind of answer to your question, that that's the intent to, to draw down the numbers. Yeah, I think we are. I mean, they're not letting any food in. Uh, right now it's about 200 trucks a day on a good day, you know. And, and we just approved, the US Congress just approved. Nine billion. How many billion? Nine billion for humanitarian aid. Oh. Yeah, but 26 billion for. Five billion for more. For Israel. I mean, we keep sending more munitions and you know, it's kind of, it's insane that we're paying for both sides. Like we're paying to humanitarian aid, but we're also paying for the bombs. It's insane. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had, when I show my poor world history knowledge, um, but the, the broader context, like I don't know what, um, what countries like feel responsible in Europe as far as uh, starting Israel. I know it, it was after World War II that they were like, oh, we'll just give Jews, just get them out of, it seemed like it was just like, Britain was like, just get them out of Europe. Like, and that was it, the, it was the, early in the 20th century. It was the night. It was the racism in Europe that yeah. created the need for the nation of Israel. Because right, right, they were right. racist. They, they, they had the Jewish problem, as they called it. Right, right. And they wanted to push them out. So let's make them a country. Yeah. 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 So these are two books I highly recommend for you. One is by Rashid Khalidi. Uh, the the Hundred Years War, yeah, on Palestine and decolonizing Palestine. So that's it. <laughs> so thank you to Nusheen. Thank you to all of you who are here and participating in this discussion. Of course, as a church, we've been talking about this for a while now. I don't know if you've been a part of Becoming Peacemakers, which is the group that meets every other Wednesday at 8 p.m. We meet in here, but most folks attend through Zoom. But we're having these conversations, right? There's, there's so much more left on the table here, and we're working through it, and working through what our witness as the church is supposed to be. One concrete step that you can take today in response to our time here is there's a form letter out there alongside those other handouts. Um, which is, is what we're doing in partnership with Riverside and Presbyterian Avenue, Lafayette. Um, wait, Lafayette Avenue, Presbyterian, yeah. And uh, we're, we're doing a, a letter writing campaign to our representatives to ask them to call for a ceasefire. Um, and so if you wanna just, you know, just put your name in on there and sign it at the bottom um, and leave that there, we can bring that, uh, those letters to our representatives. So that's another step you can take. Um, but as you go today, uh, can we just thank uh, Elder Nushin one more time for her wonderful presentation. All right, take care, y'all. See you soon.